Thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate that, uh, that introduction, but I also appreciate and like to echo the appreciation you have shown for uh, the peoples whose land this really is. And I've had the opportunity to work both with, uh, in, uh, in the USA, the Southwest, there are a lot of Native uh, Americans, as some of us like to say, the real Americans. Not the real Americans. <laughs> And, um, and then uh, also the Maori New Zealand. And um, I have a very similar sense of reverence that I wish I had. I feel a little bit like that, uh, I forgot who it was, Sally in When Harry Meets Sally. And the woman is faking the, you know, the lunch thing and she says, I want what she's having. Um, and it's a little bit light because I've been to conferences and as you can tell, as a matter of fact, if I talk too loud, just play, Jim, slow down. Just, I, I'm very open to feedback. Um, I try to be. <laughs> but, um, and I found myself in a meeting with a woman who took what seemed to me forever to say something. And of course, I always act like I get paid for the word per minute, which is not the same as meaningful words per minute. But she would stop and look up, and then she'd say, and furthermore, depending on, you know, and she was pausing, and I thought, this woman's either not very bright, or, you know, or she's a control freak. How arrogant. She's really taking my time. I and mean, it's really, this is embarrassing. I shouldn't start with it. But I told her, I, said, asked, I asked her, I said, I noticed you speak very slowly and very deliberately, and why is that? And she said, this gets to me, she said, my grandfather <laughs> is always with me. And he says, spirit, she was Native American, and I always check everything that I'm gonna say with him. And I went, damn. <laughs> Mr. Impatient, you know, take your meds, Jim, and learn something. <laughs> so I echo and tried to give some, some substance to the things that we have learned and can learn, and the opportunity to work with so many different peoples has been just wonderful for us in FFT. But let me jump into this before I get a little bit too carried away with these feeling things. This just says it's the presentation today. I do this for a couple of reasons, but the big one is, I hope, we, we pay a lot of money to try to have websites and things. So I hope if you're interested in this, that you'll go to ffteinc.com, and we have lots of information there, as many programs do. And on the right, Holly FFT at Comcast, she's the one who organizes all of our lives. So she's the communications director. So if you say, I'd like more of what Jim talked about at this, or he said he had some data sets on that, or he talked about, could you send it? And she just organizes all that. And of course, I'm the middle one. And I really, I don't know if I'm a lonely guy or I'm just very interactive, but uh, I really appreciate if you just email me directly, if you have some questions. Um, uh, people, do, it's not like 6,000 people do that, not to worry. Um, but if you have specific questions or follow-up things, I'll try to get things channeled in the right direction. Or if there's something specific about what I say, I'd uh, appreciate knowing. Um, the other thing is that we have time at the end to ask questions. But if something really hits you in a way that just, I, just, I can't wait. Um, and as long as that's not a characterological flaw in you. But if you, you know, go ahead and, and raise your, we can take a break, you know, because again, I'm, FFT is a very interactive model. It's a very bi-directional influencing model. It's not a top-down applying a set of techniques. Um, so I just can't help but behave that way. So if anything hops up, otherwise, we'll talk again at the end. Over there on the left, that little arrow was where my office is, that's Salt Lake City. And uh, now I wanna uh, say a couple of things. One, they waited three and a half years to get that air clarity. You know, I mean, it just, you know, these are Chamber of Commerce pictures and it's this lens that makes everything look like it's real close together. Um, but that's a great place to have an office. As you can see, we have great views. 
uh, until I tell you that the seismic people came in and considered that, rated that as the most earthquake prone to collapse building in all of Salt Lake. We straddled one of the biggest faults. So they came and they did a population density. We don't have a lot of classrooms in there, so it was low priority. And finally they came and I think they glued popsicle sticks around the, the bottom, you know, so <clears throat> we're always looking to get into a new building, but it isn't gonna happen. But um, I just wanted to share a little bit about where I come from and what it looks like most of the time. The context, and I'm gonna also thank Don specifically for the invitation and all the warmth, and we won't try to get into dinner last night because those are stories that I, they're gonna pay me not to pay, uh, say over here. But Don, a couple of things, I want to leave them with a real sense that is possible and a feeling for what might work in a specific context. And I wanna, and I kinda of put things together as best I could to respond to that. And he said, we'll be interesting in knowing more about the details, about the difficulties, challenges of implementation, reluctant families, and the therapist effects. So as opposed to, I want a massive data set so you can overwhelm them. With each of your 36 studies or your 19 randomized trials and go through every one so the evidence is irrefutable, he didn't say that. <clears throat> so it took a lot for me not to do that. But, because uh, we all get very defensive and we get, you know, what this day does. <clears throat> but I'm going to try to respond to that. I hope I do. So some definitions. So everybody has a definition of evidence-based and cost-effective. We've got a bunch of core research. I think we've done an extremely good job looking at the core elements. For example, we've got published trials that demonstrate the difference between male therapists and female therapists. Almost all clinical models, they tell you what to do in session three, or they tell you how to do a red dog left on three, hut, hut, hut. You know, they say, this is what kind of, this is what we do in PMT. What it oftentimes doesn't say is, this is what you do when you're a female versus when you're a male. But we first did the research and we found females versus males, therapists, and, uh, uh, get very different reactions from mothers and fathers in conjoint family therapy. And the truth is that if you go uh, according to traditional theories of psychotherapy, female therapists have a tougher time because they get more resistance, more cross-gender resistance from fathers, especially because a lot of the females are young. And you're not gonna come in here and tell me how to raise my kid. Okay, so they get different kind of resistance. On the other hand, they get more support from mothers than males get from fathers, you got that? So it's a bigger spread. As been explained to me by most of my female colleagues, and we have more women than men working as supervisors, that's a good thing because we're capable of dealing with more difficult situations. <clears throat> so I'll just leave that right where it is. But those kinds of things, what happens in the room, what it feels like to do this stuff is very informative. We've tried to build a big evidence base around that. Then we've got change mechanisms research. Several of the presentations have talked about, you don't wanna know just what happens, but how it happens. So we look and see the dynamics of what happens between mothers and fathers, the therapists, the kids, that kind of thing. And it's expensive research to do, but it's invaluable. Um, and then, of course, we have efficacy and effectiveness studies. And, you know, efficacy has always been the gold standard in our field. And yet efficacy, a lot of times you pay a lot of prices for randomly assigning people that otherwise are the same. So a lot of times you just have to do an effectiveness study and you control the best you can. And so we think it's important to have both. So the total is across all those, we have I think 36 published studies. We didn't do a lot of them, which is good. You should never trust anything that any one of us, including me, did. Oh, it all comes from Alexander's shop, uh-huh, and I bet you it looks good for Alexander. You know, No, you want independent people replicating your work. And so we've been doing this since 1973. And here is just, this is an old slide, but it just gives you an idea about the magnitude of effects. Lower left, these are just the engagement and retention rate, the percentage of families in different FFT sites 
the first five bars, which are pretty high, and then the 50% is what Alan Kasdan has published as the base rate of retention with these kinds of families, the high-risk families of youth dealing with this. Just keeping them in makes a big difference. And then you've got one, two, and three-year follow-ups. One of those studies over there, no, one of those studies on the right is a five-year follow-up of the uh, families uh, five years after treatment. So you see the arrest rates um, before and the arrest rates after uh, five years, with, and now they're adults. And um, one of the things that's interesting, and I mentioned this before with one of our other presenters, we can't do 20, we can't even do 10 year. It's hard to do five year follow up because in many states, not when we started, they would open the door and let us go through all their records. But now with human subjects and human protection and all the legal kinds of things, you need all kinds of things. Uh, even the Pope's blessing won't get it for you. He's leaving anyway. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we can't get those kind of, because they, if, they, if they don't misbehave, they get their records expunged. And so there's all kinds of, it's hard to find data. So, but in the old days, we could get quite a bit more. But all these show are different comparisons. Those are randomized trials on the upper left. They're controlled comparison upper right. This is a particular um, comparison randomized within, uh, this is in Las Vegas. And that's a wonderful place to try to do family therapy. And, um, and you, can, you can't really read all that kind of stuff, but the average adjudicated rate for those kids was five. That wasn't five arrests, that was five adjudicated cases. By the time they have seen a judge five times, the judges are pretty pissed off. And so, and all of these kids were destined to go to the Spring Mountain facility. If any of you know that, and outside of Las Vegas, just, you know, conjure up a guess. Uh, they don't run away from the place because they have nothing but desert out there. You know. So, um, and there was the treatments as usual, and the three measures tell you the total group recidivism uh, at 12 months, the uh, violence recidivism, which is the green bars, and the drug recidivism, which is the light blue. So it gives you um, a real sense across a lot of different programs that it seems to, FFT seems to be able to have a pretty consistent result. And our average number of sessions is still 12 to 15. We are very short term. And one of the other presenters already mentioned, you know, you do this with longer, you do it more time, it's no better. You have your impact early. And those, that research, we haven't been the only ones that do that. You just don't need that long a time. Uh, either you have an impact or you don't. So in other words, the cost benefit starts to go away. So what does it take to do this stuff? This is just my little, we believe you need to be accountable. Before you go out and sell, say I'm gonna do something and you should pay me and send your kids to me, we think you need to have, be accountable. Then we need to know which factors contribute to and maintain problems. What are the risk and protective factors? And what's interesting is what the risk and protector factors that we hear about on TV and most human beings think are risk factors often tens times are not. You know, but they watch Dr. Drew and of course they watch Dr. Nancy and they watch Dr. Phil. And he has, he can tell you a lot about, you know, but the point is that isn't what the literature necessarily supports. And we heard a little bit about that today. And then to have a model, we, you need to know how to minimize the impact of the negative factors and enhance the positive factors. And you really need to consider the intra-individual. We heard today about close, closed head injury and uh, a various kind of brain dysfunction. That's inside the kid. They bring, it, they bring in the whole thing. Then you need to know individual differences. Then the familial and the extra-familial, the human environment. All of those, if you look at the predictors in the literature of bad behavior, it's huge. And it's in all those domains. But what's really interesting is you can't just start throwing things at it. We have one great study that showed that cognitive behavior, if you do cognitive behavior with drug individual, with drug involving adolescents and then follow with FFT, it has no superior effect to just doing FFT alone. But if you do FFT first and then follow it with cognitive behavior, 
you have significantly positive effects. So the, the sequence in which you do things, we're all about doing the sequences and doing the right time, and you'll see this later on. It isn't just about doing the right time, but it's doing the right thing at the right time. And you get them out of order and you're a mess. So then we need to know how to change the things we can change, but we need to know how to work around things we can't change. We all lament, we can't do anything about these people are poor. Well, I plan on them being poor after I finish. So we can't hide behind that. If we accept that, then what I have to say is, I know poor people in poverty are at greater risk for having these bad outcomes. My model becomes poor people who do not have bad outcomes. Not how to make them all look like a Dr. Phil family. And that's a big mistake a lot of times we make. And see, what this requires is you need to be able to understand and respect the families on their terms, because we don't try to turn, turn them into somebody they're not. Then we need to respect, support, and train our therapists. I have another slide, but I'll just go ahead. Our therapists account for 50% of our outcome variance. We treat them all the same. We train them. They have to see the same things. They have to listen to me the same way. Still, 50% of the outcome variance is what they do differently. And so the whole idea is they account for a lot of the weight, not just the program. And right now, we're spending as much time studying what makes for things that, that don't work when people are doing FFT. What are the therapist characteristics? So we can help either in training or selection, okay? Then we developed partnerships to disseminate and sustain FFTs. And then, as a lot of mutual feedback, you have to be able to be open to feedback, but you also have to have a system where you can provide it. Additional elements. Change in something like this, I like to use pregnancy or metaphors like that. You have to do certain things before you start worried about the uh, prenatal care. And the kid has to be in the first trimester before you start doing things in the second trimester. I don't want to get gory details, but there's a developmental process and you gotta follow that process. And the same thing happens here. So one of the things is, people say, what are the elements of your program? And they give you six elements. They said, now how do you phase them in? That's a very important consideration. Then, each phase has unique goals and elements. So it's like therapists say, what phase am I in and what am I supposed to do? Rather than, this is what I do in therapy, some generic thing. And then we have uh, specific techniques in each phase. And then therapists, there are specific behaviors required of therapists in each phase. It's an interesting thing, but I have to literally sometimes say, okay, what is my strength? I am much better at engagement and motivation. I am not very good at behavior change. I get bored, I get impatient. Other people of our, our therapists are great at behavior change. They love the precision and sticking with people and things like that. But they're clu well, not clueless, but they really get overwhelmed with the motivation phase because it's just not real. I just want to get around to teaching them what they need to learn. But our data are very clear. You start doing behavior change before they're ready, it blows up. So, and then we all follow this. I'm gonna come back to this. Uh, principle of matching. Matching, we use that term all the time. It's not mirroring, but it's matching. So, respectfulness on their terms is a very important part of this. And I'll just try to give you some quick examples. For example, respectfulness does not include when the kid comes in, you say, take off the hat. I don't know how many therapists I know say, why don't we take off the hat? Or better yet, let's pull out the earphones we're going to do a little family therapy here. That's disrespectful. Well, you got to be kidding. How can you ever do good therapy if the kid's sitting there listening? To me? Well, what we say is you need to figure out how to do it. And they're back there. They got their own hat. They have all their little hiding things that they're doing. Hair down if they haven't shaved their heads and all this. And they're doing all that. And you talk. And pretty soon you'll see them start to do this kind of thing. Or I'll just turn to them and say, now, Tom, I'm not sure you can hear, but what your mom and I were just talking about, and go, yeah, 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 
They can hear through that thing, unless their things are so loud you can hear it through their brains into the next office. But just simply not saying, take off the hat, take the things out of your ears, because that's there you're saying, you've got to follow my rules. And that, for them, is part of their lives. You might as well cut off a finger, just take out an earpiece. So I just use that as an example. Understanding them as they experience themselves, which is not always easy. Then a balanced alliance. We've got a lot of good data that show the more unbalanced the alliance, kid with therapist, mother with therapist, father with therapist, the more unbalanced, the higher the dropout rate. So we have to tell people, boy, you get a mom in there who's just ready to go and she's so excited and saying, thank God, and uh, she's crying and all the rest and we want to do, please tell us what to do. You get real sucked into having an alliance with her because at least she's not brain dead and, and dad and the son aren't sitting there going <laughs> to each other, you know? Well, you can't go with that thing. You have to say, I got the alliance with her. I got to get it with them. You know, so you learn to say things like, uh, are you guys testing the wind in here or is there something, you know, going on? And I'm, I'm responding to where they are. And you learn how to deal with things like whatever, and, you know, <clears throat> so. so. And strength-based in every family member. We get so used to talking about depressed. We have highly depressed mothers. We got highly depressed fathers too, but they won't admit it. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> but mothers, and they come in and they're very depressed. What we work hard to do is to see the strength in that. The last thing you want to do is say, oh, you poor dear, I can see how hard this is for you and how much, do you see what you're doing to your mother? And I'm here to help you because you are so, and I, you know, you are so pathetic and weak. Now, we don't say that, right? But we do. Oh, dear, I can see how you're hurting this and this kind of stuff. We're much more likely to say, you know, there's something because you're coming across. I can feel, I can feel how much pain you're in. So what I'm saying is you got more skill than many people I know about being out in front with your pain. I don't have to guess. And I appreciate your ability to do that. You have a very effective way of showing me what's going on. Now, I got a funny feeling it may not work the same way with Tomas here. See, you use it, but that's strength-based rather than I'm here to help you and do a Dr. Phil. So. <clears throat> By the way, he makes more money than all of us put together, so <laughs> don't, you know, but I, there's not much envy there. No. We've heard a lot about, and I threw this in afterwards, uh, we heard about Washington State, WS, uh, 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 WSIPP, cost benefit analysis. Steve Aos is the guy who's done most of this. And they, uh, they did a uh, blueprints and evidence-based programs in the state, late 1990s and early 2000. And as a result of this, and actually I saw Steve present this uh, in London, a couple years ago, he dropped this little thing and said, oh yes, I was over at 10 uh, Downing. <laughs> and I'm going back, oh, come on, Steve. But this cost-benefit analysis. <clears throat> for FFT, AOS et al. cited a return of $12 for every $1 invested. That is huge. Now, a lot of people could really care less about these kids because they are annoying. But when we say you can save a lot of money doing this rather than that, and now you're talking. It's absolutely amazing. Steve literally says, without wincing, I can make Republicans and Democrats happy at the same time. I can save you money, and I can make your family better. And, so, and, and he flat out says that. A uh, preliminary report from Bernowski found $7 back for every $1. And what they decided to do, the Washington State legislatures, they had planned to begin construction of a new juvenile facility. You know, maximum security. They have different levels of security. And they canceled it. And right there, he said, the state considered they had saved $2 billion. And I asked him, I said, $2 billion? And he said, do you know how much it costs not to build them, but to maintain them? the security 
the heating, the medical, and all the rest, those things are incredibly uh, uh, expensive. And if a kid gets sick in there, we all get sued. So it's $2 billion is a lot of money. Some people say, maybe we should talk. So, <clears throat> so evidence-based, taking care of that, a mature clinical model. You've heard this, it's randomized, which is our way of saying replicable. As a training protocol, we have video, PowerPoint, handouts, we have ongoing supervision and structured feedback. The first year a team does FFT, they, they meet every week and every single case they see goes into our database. It's a HIPAA compliant secure database. So we can scan that. We're getting data all the time. And that's because we believe you have to have oversight. They have to know, therapists have to know somebody's watching. And then on Tuesday, we're going to talk to them. And we say, uh, exactly what's happened <laughs> there? Because the data come back looking squirrely. And then we can have feedback. Rather than, oh, every three months we'll all get together and have a pep talk and find out how you're doing. So much more immediate. Um, <clears throat> and that's all part of those costs that are figured in, trust me. And FFT as appropriate and has been evaluated with diverse populations. I'm just going to throw in that one. This was the first six months of 2006. And uh, I forgot the sample size there, but it was in our large database where we had decent. And if you look here, the Caucasian, the African American, the Hispanic, and then the other, non one of those, because some people check other. If you look overall, there's a remarkably a uh, similar outcome, the same number of incompletes, minimal pot change, satisfactory, moderate, and positive change. This is, we try to make it so it's a universal, rather than just a white people or a black people or a Maori people kind of thing. But to do that, you have to individualize and you have to match. That's where that comes from. Is that, is, are we doing okay? <clears throat> So that's the mature clinical model, well-established dissemination model. We have FFT consultants. All of our consultants come from within the system. So they ask, well, how do you train them? Well, first of all, they start out with therapists, and we know how they behaved in sessions because we got data on each one. And then they became specialists in their field, and some of them became team supervisors. And then from the team supervisors, they received separate training to be national consultants. And then some of them got some additional training to be trainers. So we have this system where you come up through the ranks. We don't hire experts from outside. It may sound kind of snobbish, but people who've already been doing this three or four years, they understand the model a whole lot better. And they can do a better job of supervision. So there's a particular philosophy there, okay? Training philosophy, we train to the goal of competence. That's important, not to purity, not to wonderfulness, not to cheers of the crowd, just competence. How's the kid doing? He's competent, you know? He's doing great. Oh, but is he fulfilled? Has his inner child? I have no idea. But his grades have gone up to a B minus from a, an F. He's back in school, and apparently he's coming up clean on his drug tests. That's competent adolescent. I don't need any more than that. And we don't, we said, you can say, well, you set the bar pretty low. No, we set the bar at much higher uh, effectiveness and much lower recidivism. When you try to make people more than competent, you're putting a lot of demands on them. Okay? We train to maintenance. Once you get in to do something, keep doing it. Parents, therapists, everything. We train into integrating new team members so you can learn to be open when somebody's grandchild comes and lives with you or a new team member uh, uh, um, joins the team. We train to internal supervisory competence. Parents of supervisors, we help them become competent supervisors in the family. And we do the same thing with our teams. And we train to increasing team independence. We have a bad business model. The first year we're there all the time. Then the next year it costs half as much and we're there half the time. And the third year and beyond, we're hardly there. We want you to be independent but competent the same way we want our adolescents to be independent and competent. 
You know, but people say, but you're not building in. They always have to pay you the same amount every year. No, they don't have to. Well, aren't you going to go broke? I don't think so. You know, it's an interesting idea. Um, <clears throat> then we research change mechanisms. I already say that. Efficacy and effectiveness and generalization and replication, how it looks across sites. Something we'll either talk about today or maybe tomorrow, some of you will be seeing, is the issues of accommodation and adaptation. One of the things that sends chills down my t uh, spine, we go and they say, well, we made a need to tweak the model a little bit. <laughs> tweak, it's a great, it sounds like just a yeah, yeah, tweak, you know. And pretty soon, well, the way we tweak it is we see all the family members individually the first three times. That's not tweaking the model. You're not doing FFT. And you tend to be doing something that's associated with worse outcomes. So we spend a lot of time, are you adapting the model? And if so, what's your research evidence for it? Because you can't say I'm doing FFT, fund us for doing FFT because we've adopted it. Now accommodation is somewhat different. I think FFT is in about seven different languages now. And I had a woman from Jordan who's actually been living in uh, Egypt and she came for two years and she translated our manual into um, Arabic. That manual looks so good in Arabic. You know, the letters and the scrolls. I don't understand where she said, here, did I do a good job? I have no idea. <laughs> but it's a pretty job, <clears throat> you know. And she's going to go back and replicate in Egypt. Well, if they don't close everything down. So, and we'll talk about that if we have time. But <clears throat> beyond the research and the training philosophy, there's more elements. It's, an, it's a phasic model. I already said that. Why am I looking up there? I have it right here. Sorry, I'll just, you know. It has five major phases. I've already mentioned that, so let me get into some content. We have engagement. I don't know if you can see motivation there. We have behavior change and generalization. And I'll just point out some things. Engagement and motivation, it's a bi-directional arrow. You can be kind of in both places at once, but in general, you start with engagement. And that yellow line over here, I hope I do the right thing. Yep, that little line right there. FFT actually starts before the first session. You'll see that in a minute. And then you go as quickly as you can into motivation. And we do motivation before we do behavior change. Now, when I was growing up, it used to be the old two by four approach. What do you mean two by four? Well, you got to hit them in the head with a two by four to get them to pay attention. Well, we'd like to say this, not maybe the best metaphor, but the point is you start doing things to change behavior before they're motivated to buy into the program, you're fighting it the whole time. So we take time to do motivation, but you notice the sessions only, we're 12 to 15 sessions. That's it. And then behavior change, and then what we call generalization or your multi-systemic linking so as we begin changes happening in the family, then we start working, getting the kid back into school, working with other systems outside the family that can maintain the processes. That's all those, that's what all that means. Okay, so far? All right. <clears throat> Assessment really transcends each of those phases but assessment is different. The assessment we do during engagement is different than what we do in motivation and different than what we do in behavior change. So let me do here. And I hope this is okay. I love this slide, but some people by now are starting to, huh. Assessment, you're always assessing. But your formal assessment is early on. You give them all the tests and stuff. Most of that before you ever see them. A lot of times we get a referral they've already been tested out the WAS. We know what their IQ is, they know what their criminal history is. We know that, number of offenses and everything. Then we do relational assessment, and that's what happens usually in the session. Because the relational assessment tells us about what we need to know because it's the relationships that are gonna make this work. And that's our first target. And then we do behavioral assessment. So I'm not so worried about the kid, get the kid to stop drinking until I understand about the relationships about which the drinking occurs. What it represents in terms of peers, what it represents in terms of mom, dad, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we mean by relational assessment. 
and then a lot of behavioral assessment, but you notice that starts last. Engagement is a very short period. Once you're 20 minutes into the first session, you're through engaging. Engagement basically means just getting them in, but sometimes you've got a lot of calling on the phone to get them started in the first place. Sometimes the PO was like, it ordered them to come in. I said, well, then how come then mom and dad are sitting here? Mom's sitting here, but the kid isn't there. Well, I told him he'd better. Well, mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's try that again. May I use your cell phone, mom? May I call your son? Do you know his number? That kind of stuff. And we talk to him directly. And then you reframe. You make a strength-based approach rather than where are you and the PO told you to be here it's much more likely to say, you know, I don't know what's going on here, but a lot of times when a young man like you doesn't show for the first session, what he's really saying is, without admitting it, I know my mom is hurting big time, and I sure wish somebody would take care of her so I don't have to. I'm having enough trouble being a kid. That's powerful. Mom hears that. She feels a lot of support, but the kid here says, there might have been a positive motive for your not being here, a noble intention. Now, do I know that? Am I a mind reader? No. But what we find is if we tend to talk to everybody that way, a lot more positivity happens, as opposed to, as your PO told you, I'm going to tell your PO you didn't get here one more time, and you're busted, mister. Whatever, you know, I mean, I just, we just don't go down that route. We know they've already heard that 50 times. You heard uh, the other day about repeated warnings and all that. I think it was yesterday. So we engage systems. We make sure they're on board. Then we engage the family. Then motivation is the first major thing we do, but it's short. Then we get into behavior change and then generalization, all the multisystemic stuff. So everything has a place, but we don't do it all at once. We don't say, okay, let's start talking about you're wandering the house all night and uh, uh, getting high in the bedroom, and then let's get work, start working on getting you back in school. And mom, this depression kind of stuff, it just whining around the house, you're not doing the dishes, aren't getting the, let's just take all that on. We don't do that. We organize the steps through which we're going to work, Okay. Beyond the research base, I've already talked about this, we're big on quality control. So, hold on to your seats. Is everybody okay? Okay. <clears throat> Do it that way. And all you know is, he in his head may be trying. But all you're saying is, that is so unloving. That is so short of the mark. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's me. That's my younger brother. Let me tell you about this kid. This is mom, and dad's not even the picture, but I'm looking at dad. Dad recently lost his job in construction, and now he's uh, driving a truck, okay? He looks like a Las Vegas truck driver. He's kind of short and about as wide as the door, and I ain't going to mess with him, you know? Hunt bear with a switch. You've heard all those things. Mom is clinically depressed. She runs a daycare in her home. She is incredible. I just her nonverbals just make me want to cry. I don't know how she makes it from one day to the next. She's also a good Christian woman who believes that she's responsible for raising her children for her God, and she feels like the biggest failure in the universe. This isn't just about the kid. It is about her feeling horrible. And then you got kid. His formal record as the last charge was weapons possession. He was arrested with a handgun. He's had multiple DUIs. He's had multiple burglaries. And there's in between, not documented, but suspected, it came with the referral, gang involvement. But he's not necessarily big in a gang, but Las Vegas has him, okay? And of course, and you, earlier on, you'd see him come in with the headset. That came off, but he keeps the hat on the whole time. So now you're going to hear just a real short example about what FFT is about, and hopefully it doesn't look like really what you expected. Do it that way, and all you know is he in his head may be trying. Dad may be trying. Is, that is so 
unloving. That is so short of the mark. You don't get it. And somebody like me from the outside says this was set up to fail. It was set up to fail and it breaks my heart. And I got two theories. One, you're trying to, quote, act out is the word, phrase we use so you can accelerate the getting out of here. Or this is your last shot. I'm going to act out enough and we're going to finally take it on and get it fixed or else this is my last time. I'd rather you exit this family in that more positive way. That's my non-hidden agenda. I that's think why I exiting my it. family would be positive. That's the only thing the positive that's going to go on with my family. And I think maybe it might get a little bit better than there. I might not be as pissed off when I talk to my dad because I don't have to talk to him as much and you know, we wouldn't. He did go to adolescent addiction school. <laughs> Would you blow your nose before the next session? <laughs> but you can hear it. Uh oh. I do. do it that way. Sorry. And all you know is he in his head may be trying. But all you're saying is that is so unlike. Whoops. See how I was able to be on everybody's side at the same time? Uh-oh, I didn't hit anything. Did I screw it up? There we go. It's going to go on with my family. Thank you. And I think maybe it might get a little bit better than there. I might not be as pissed off when I talk to my dad because I don't have to talk to him as much. And, you know, we wouldn't, he wouldn't think that he has, like, God power over me, you know? He's not my God. Okay. He can't tell me what to do, who to hang out with. He can't tell me, like, and it's not going to make a difference they, because he doesn't. Notice the touch. He, he never tried. I don't know how to explain no. it. He, yes, you did. He, he, he's not the way, he's not like my dad in the sense that he wants to try to try to help me, you know, be a better person in life. But he wants to be my dad in respect that I have to, you know, kiss his ass, you know, and mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. and like, and that's the only way. So I'm not going to give it to him because he's not giving me the, the dad that I want. Because uh, so I'm not going to give him the son that he wants. Okay, fine. I I, I'm I, sorry. I, I, I wouldn't ask you to. Now you know somebody say, you well, we'll work on that. No, I'm not going to ask you to do that. What I am going to ask you to, the, the issue here, and tell me if I heard you right. You're saying, well, here's the issue, here's the deal. He missed at age ten and a half. If he would have done it before I was ten and a half, there was still chance. Now it's I'm too late. There is up. nothing you can do to make it right. Fuck you. Lord. And that may what? Say, that's right. That's okay. right. <laughs> and that may be. That may that may be. And that's 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 unfortunately I can't. I said that right. Yeah, the fuck you. Okay, part. right. Now. Okay, <clears throat> now we talk about matching. First of all, it's okay if somebody said, that's it, buddy. We don't do that. We're not going to be modeling that kind of behavior. We're here to model appropriate adult behavior and nice guy stuff like this. You know, I want to create an alliance with everybody in the room. And I don't know if you noticed, but Kid was laughing. He's trying to put his headphone back on, but that was pathetic. And Dad was laughing. Okay, fine. I wouldn't ask you to. I wouldn't ask you to. He wants so but much I am to gonna ask you to. back in. The, the issue here, and tell me if I heard you right, you're saying, well, here's the issue, here's the deal. He missed at age ten and a half. If he would have done it before I was ten and a half, there was still chance. Now it's too late. There is nothing you can do to make it right. Fuck you. Lord. And that may what? Said, that's right. That's okay. Right. <laughs> and that may be. Here, Dad. That may, that may be. And that's, 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 uh, unfortunately, I can't, I said that right. Yeah, the fuck you Okay, part. right. Now, All right, let me move ahead. So the point is, that's matching. I didn't tell him how, to, had, how he had to behave, and I matched him. I know how that, that's how they talk to each other. I went into their family on their terms and respectfully. And the next thing you see is run out of time. How about we come back tomorrow? Yeah. I mean, that's, and that epitomizes a whole session. 
but there's nothing about telling them what we're going to do and how he should do. It's all about building alliance, especially with the ones who don't want to have one built with them. Okay? I'm running out of time, and I don't know if these numbers are changing <laughs> dramatically. But super summary, respectfulness. And you notice we use the word respectfulness, but not respect. I am sorry, but I'm not very good at showing respect for a lot of people. I don't like them. They disgust me. I'm a judgmental jerk. I failed in the Buddhist camp. <clears throat> but I can, res re I can behave respectfully. And to behave respectfully, it's what they consider to be respect, not what me and my culture calls respect. OK? Family-focused intervention, balanced alliance. Therapists do not take sides. And we avoid being judgmental during engagement motivation. We're not there to do Dr. Phil. We're not there to say, Dad, you're going to have to. And then we wonder why fathers don't participate in our th family therapy. OK? I don't have strong feelings about this. We focus on strength-based as best we can. The, the interventions that we do are specific and individualized. They're matched to the unique challenges of every family in terms of their abilities, their experience, and all the rest. So we have some people writing notes to each other because they just cannot communicate. That verbal relational stuff is just not in their strength and comfort zone. But they can write letters. That's a very distancing kind of relationship. But they can write notes. Others, notes won't do it. They need to smell you. They need to see you. And then the tricky part is, how do I let you write notes when I let you get close enough that you can see if your dad's sweating or not. And you set up programs like that. And all of a sudden, they think, we all can have our way. I don't have to change for you, and you don't have to change for me. We just have to change what we're doing. So, and it's overriding relational. So I'm going to have to end and get some questions here, because I'm just getting started. But I just want to show you. So what do we do? We focus first on the family, but we recognize people come in with individual factors, but we struggle with whether or not they're ADHD after we've got started. I'm sitting there saying, we're coming up with a program for this kid, but I notice he can't even sit still in the session. What can we do to help him manage what's going on and not make him sit still during the whole session? One may be to drug him, <laughs> you know, we could maybe do that. Or we can say, it's okay with me if you circle the room. I'm okay with that. Well, just so he don't get behind me, I don't know if I trust you that much. And they laugh. And what you're saying is you're okay the way you are. It's okay that you're in the session this way because you're sticking with me. Okay? And the parents also say, gee, we don't have to just shut everything down. It's OK. All right? Then we got to pay attention to school, community, and all that. So FFT, this is a horrible slide. In the engagement motivation assessment, we focus on what's going on with the family relationship and the motivations. Then during behavior change and generalization, we go outside the family. And that's how we make all this coherent. So we break things into little groups. Uh, often it isn't what you do, but when and how you do it. And we match everything. So I'm going to just end with this with a big super summary. Because as you can imagine, I could go on forever. But <clears throat> those are the main assessments that we do and the major techniques of every phase. And I don't know how much time we have left, but you've been very patient with this. Do you have some questions, I hope? Let's thank Jim before we take the questions. Oh, thank you, thank you. You were very patient. I should thank you. So people can just raise their hand and... 
And don't forget that jfafft at aol.com, I'm happy to send you stuff, more information. Oh, we have slides. <laughs> David? Yes, David. is getting the people to the room and also making them come back and turn up. What technologies have you got outside for engaging the families we have a different outside one. the room? We have a different one. I don't know what you, I, I said it, but you didn't get to see it. But when I said, did this great, you know, and the kids laughing and everything's okay, and I say, I see you tomorrow, you're like, yeah. We don't do 12 to 15 sessions in 12 to 15 weeks. With high-risk families, you make a decision. Can they make it three days without a screw-up? I'll see you in two. Can they make it two and a half weeks without a screw-up? They're going sailing or something like that. Good, I'll see you in two and a half weeks. But we at the front end, which is a front-loaded therapy, the whole idea of doing weekly therapy is deadly with these families. They cannot maintain, so we just don't ask them to do that. And then we have homework assignments. If we're going to see them in one day, or we're going to see them in three days, or we're going to see them in 10 days. This is what I want you to do, and this is how you stay with the program. Sometimes we send them home with information, but we do that and we do it through them in the session. Okay? That's the biggest part. People say we do weekly therapy. I'm going, you must be a managed care system <laughs> and you're not going to do very well because families just don't work on a weekly basis. It's just that easy. But what's neat is after you see them three times in the first two weeks, then you can start seeing them every other week. We have tremendous, we do 12 to 15 sessions in 12 to 15 weeks, but we don't do weekly therapy. There is no evidence that will support that. The drama all happens early on. You've heard this about, you have American OBGYN. Nobody else in the world has babies the way we have babies here. We do it for the convenience of the OBGYN in the hospital. Most other people have babies, they do it a whole different way. Jim, what if a parent won't participate? That is our job. The parent won't participate. Of course they'll participate. But you mean if they say we won't do it? That's at least half, if not two-thirds, of the cases, the referrals we get. That's that pre-engagement. So let me see if I can just give you a quick example of it. I'm not going in. One of my favorites says, he is ruining the family. Our girls are doing great. But he was before our girls. You know, this is a remarriage, you know. And, um, and, and he's just like his father. Have his father come in. You know, he's not going to do a damn thing, I'll tell you that. And he's ruined the family. I'd rather he go out to Spring Mountain or wherever it is facility. I said, I understand that. What I'd like to do, what I ask you, I have a funny feeling if your wife or, you know, his mom and you come in without you, they're going to have a particular perspective, a bias about you. As a man, I'd like to hear how you see things because I think I can understand things from a man's perspective. And I'm just asking you to come in next Friday one time. Well, I'll come in, yeah, I'll tell you what's going wrong. I have asked him to be the jerk he is and he's there. Now, if, it's, if I'm a female therapist, you know, then, and, and that's where you get the real resistance from fathers. You know, you so, oh, Mr. Big Brute Guy, you know, I mean, no, you know, I understand, but here's what I'm worried about. One of the things we've experienced is a lot of time, because you can tell I'm a woman, and a lot of times when women together, you know these jokes about we have to go to the bathroom together and we have to do this and they're always talking? And what happens is we'll never get a male perspective in there. And I'd like you to at least come in so we can get a better picture of what's going on. Not a balance, a better picture. Even though you know in your heart of hearts he's a jerk and he's drunk. Oh, and we get quite a few people show up high. And, and I know there's some agencies say we won't, cert we won't see a family if one of them is high. And we go, man, you must have not many sessions. <laughs> Of course we see him. I said, you know, I don't, you know, call me stupid, but either the, o the ozone is real bad and your eyes are all red and everything, but I think you're high. I think you're high. 
You know, oh, no, I'm not. You know, I said, listen, tell you what. You can't understand the world the way I do when you're high. And I can't understand the world the way you do when you're high. What I'd like to do is try the best I can with the idea that if you come back another time and you're not high, you let me know so I know what you said last time doesn't count. That is so matter of fact. And kids who use and feel, you know, that's like, oh, OK, all right. So I could give you lots of those things. They had one kid that was a male therapist, and he was young. And it was a single mother and the kid. And he started with the male therapist back and forth and back and forth. And finally, Jason said, look, <clears throat> we got two options. We can go outside in the parking lot and beat the shit out of each other, or we can spend some time listening to your mom. What do you think? The kid goes, right on. <laughs> you know, because I, I hear the challenge. I can do it. We can do it. We can go beat the shit out of each other. But, you know, and that's what he said to the kid, okay. As opposed to, you gotta, you got to sit down. you got to, I'm, you know, I represent truth, beauty and the entire legal system. They don't do well with that. Is I giving you a feeling for that? That's why we say engagement is so important. They, we, don't, we can't wait for them to be engaged and motivated to change. That's our job. And the way you do it, a lot of times, remember I said a lot of times there's a lot of engagement that goes on before on the phone, and you learn things, to, and so we practice. We practice and say, I'm not going to do it. I can't. We're doing swing shift. I'm going to have to change my shifts again in two weeks. I say, oh, man, what kind of, what's the shift you're going to? Man, you must be exhausted. Well, listen, can, I'd like to see you before you make that shift. And I know it's going to be hard to fit it in. But if you can't be able to come after that, at least I got an idea. You know, you just do stuff like that. You go with that flow, and you get them in. And our data are, that's why we report retention and engagement and retention rates. That makes as much sense to people who work in the system in big places like New York City, where they're lucky to have 20% of their families at age that families with children, dependent children finish. They're so... And then sometimes it doesn't work. <laughs> I think we might need to wrap it up there. Thanks I think so much, so. Jim. Thank you. I really appreciate your waiting around.